independently several times, as if it was a normal evolutionary stage in the history of culture. So, writing is basically a self-conservation of symbols. When we speak, on, or when we make a gesture, or signs with smoke, I don't know, or tam-tam, all these disappear immediately. Okay? It's just in our memory. With writing, the symbols are lasting. We can accumulate, and this represents a huge augmentation of our memory, not only the individual memory, but also the social memory. So there is an accumulation, and not only the accumulation, with this accumulation of data, we can think about what we know. We can process all these data, much more data than without writing systems. And whole civilizations has been built on this ability, cons conservation of symbols. Then there has been an improvement in writing systems, for example, the invention of the alphabet, because uh, on, in the alphabetic system we have uh, only, let's say, 30 signs, and we can say everything with only 30 signs. It, it's easier to learn, it's easier to use than, for example, the hieroglyphs of the ancient Egyptians. And from a social point of view, it was also a big uh, improvement because um, to learn how to read and write, you need, I don't know, three, four years, <laughs> but to know how to use the hieroglyph, you, you need it, I don't know, 15 years. <laughs> Okay, so more people were able to learn to read and write. It was no more reserved to a specialized caste of people. It was not a professional, it became not a professional thing, but something that could be used by a lot of people. And uh, alphabet is just an example. I can give you another one. The <coughs> The evolution of numeration systems. Okay, today we use ten uh, numerals, and we can write any kind of number with these ten numerals, <coughs> including the zero. And the meaning of each sign is determined by its position on the sequence. Okay. We are accustomed to this, but it, it has not always been like this. If you think about the Roman nu numerals, for example, and if you try to make a multiplication, a big multiplication with the Roman numerals, you will see that it is very difficult. Okay? So we can manipulate uh, numbers very easily, use always the same algorithm to do arithmetic <coughs> operations and so on. So there are a lot of improvements like this. So the Chinese uh, made their writing system more rational. They invented the paper that makes the manipulation of writing easier and so on. So there are a lot of optimization of symbol manipulation. And this uh, was the basis for another uh, stage in the human development, in the cultural evolution. Uh, you can think about the, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Arabic Empire, the Chinese Empire, and so on. Okay? Great civilizations with uh, universal philosophy, the beginning of science, and so on. And then there was um, the invention of the printing press. And after the printing press, 
the invention of other mass media, no, no, no flash, uh, other mass media, uh, like radio, television, and so on. So the, here, the principle is an automatic reproduction of symbols. Or when I say automatic, you, you can even think of industrial reproduction and diffusion of symbols. So this, of course, is a, again a huge improvement and it had a lot of consequences. Uh, for example, economic consequences, the <coughs> development of the Industrial Revolution. The printing press is the first uh, uh, process that uh, builds identical items industrially. One book, two books, four books, they are all exactly the same and they are built with a mechanical system. And then we did the same with textile and so on. Um, you can think about uh, epistemological consequences because you know that the uh, development of the modern uh, science with the uh, mathematized, mathematized theories and based on experience and observation uh, took off uh, at the 16th century after the invention of the printing press and the development of um, scientific communication, uh, libraries, uh, the improvement of uh, uh, transportation and communication in Europe was the real basis of the development of uh, the modern science. You can think also of political consequences. The, uh, the emergence of the nation states as a new political form uh, dates back from this time. There was no nation state before the printing press. Okay, there, there was empires, there was cities, there was kingdoms, but the, the notion of a political unity based on uh, cultural and linguistic unity is based on the, on the printing press. And also, you can think about religious consequences. For example, the development of the Reformation by Luther was based on the translation of the Bible that was in Latin uh, in uh, vernacular languages and the printing of the sacred text uh, that made it available for everybody. So also <coughs> You see, there are a lot of cultural consequences when you touch to this core of human culture that is the symbol manipulation. Okay, currently we uh, are at just at the beginning of a new stage of the cultural evolution. We have to understand that each new stage does not eliminate what was before, okay? Pure orality, orality still exists. Uh, we are in the same room just now and I am speaking and you are listening and after this you are going to ask me questions and so on. So orality is still there and will be always there. Writing systems will never disappear, of course. And these improvements in the coding of, of symbols will stay with us. And the situation where uh, 
any symbol can, can be automatically industrially reproduced and diffused is also still there. So it is on the basis of all this cultural history that we have to think of the new faces. Okay? It's not, it's not a replacement, it's something that adds up. So the, the new layer of symbol manipulation is about transformation, <coughs> automatic transformation of symbols. So we are in a situation where <coughs> uh, the symbols are ubiquitous, they are accessible from everywhere, whatever the place where they are physically located. Okay. You, with your smartphone or your tablet, you can access a website that is based in, I don't know, in Australia, in Europe, and so on, as if it was just there. Okay. And you can access to this website from almost anywhere if you have Wi-Fi, of course, this is the new human right. Uh, so, ubiquity. Then, interconnection. Interconnection between all the information, all the documents, hyperlinks. Okay, you uh, ask something to Google and you have a response. Everything that is on the first page of the response virtually is connected, okay? The first response, the second, the third, etc. All this is on the same page. Even if nobody had never seen these, all these information connected, just the fact that you ask to Google makes these things together. So we have one single meta, interconnected <coughs> meta document that is accessible from anywhere. And Finally, we have software, we have algorithms that can transform all this information. When I say transform, it can be, for example, translate, generally it's poorly translated, but you can translate, uh, you can add an image, you can remove an image, you can, you can do everything you want as soon as you have the right algorithm. Okay? You command this information. You don't have to transform it with your hand. You just command it. You are writing the text and uh, mm, this is something that I do very often. I don't remember a name. But I don't want to, to search and to look for it. I write X, X, X everywhere on the text and when I find the real word or the, the true name I say replace X by click and it is done. Okay? You can command the, the symbols. So now we have to think that ubiquity, interconnection and automatic transformation go together. And this is a completely new situation, and it will give birth to a new civilization. Okay, we don't know exactly what it will look like, but we know that there will be a new civilization, and that our old concepts, political concept, economic concept, maybe religious concept, but for sure, epistemological and scientific concept will be transformed. So, this is my uh, historical perspective. Now, we are going to, um, to think about the situation of human communities in this new situation. <coughs> And uh, I will, okay, so my first distinction is 
between virtual and actual. Okay. Actual is what is situated in, precisely situated in time and space. For example, I am here and I am not anywhere else. Okay. You are here and you are not anywhere else. You are precisely situated. And, of course, there will never be uh, general virtualization, uh, bodies disappearing, everything vanishing in the future. This will never happen. We, the, the material reality is here to stay. Okay? So no problem about it. And, of course, uh, our bodies uh, contain, or precisely embodies, our skills, our knowledge, and our also our human relationships. It's, it's all uh, it's related to the body. There are no human relationship without the fact that we can look at each other, shake hands, and, and so on. So, a very important part of uh, human interaction <coughs> is related to the actuality. Uh, but this is one part of the story. The other part is that everything that we do in the material world creates information. And this information is immediately recorded in the new uh, communication space that is uh, ubiquitous and transformed by algorithms and so on. So you have a kind of interaction and indeed an interdependence between the actual and the virtual. So there is a concrete aspect in human society, but now there is also an abstract aspect. The dimension of data, the Americans, they, they say big data, to suggest that there are a lot of data. And uh, uh, the French said, ah, no, this is an American word, megadata. But the meaning is that there, there is a tremendous, a huge flow of data coming out of everything that we do. And uh, of all our communication, uh, the working of all the sensors, the mesh the machines, the the smartphones and so on, <clears throat> and these data are processed by algorithms. <coughs> and there is an element of power in this, because it's not everybody that is able to control the algorithms and the data. Okay? For the data, it's more or more or less a question of, of money, of capital, let's say, because you know, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Amazon, and so on, uh, they got the data, they have the data. But we have access, <laughs> but physically they have the data set. And there is also an element of intellectual power, of know-how, uh, the ability to write, because it's a writing operation, to write algorithm with uh, pro programming languages and so on. So it's, these are the new scribes, let's say. And the social network of real people with their living knowledge, it's the new tribe, tribes. Okay. So there is a kind of uh, um, 
social relationship between the two, ideally uh, there should be a kind of um, <coughs> the, the better possible relationship between the two. If the tribes understand and control the megadata and the algorithms first, and if the megadata and the algorithm are organized to fit the needs of the tribes, it's okay. Okay, so that's the general direction uh, to where collective intelligence should be heading. So, I have used this uh, duality between virtual and actual. Then you have the thing I am speaking about. This. Okay? This is the microphone. The real one. The thing. And finally, we have the concept of microphone. Signifier, but it will signified. Okay? So the signifier is in the real world, it's a sound. The reference, the, the thing, is also in the real world, in the material world. But the signified is in the mind. Okay? It's in the human mind. It is abstract. And you cannot understand signification or meaning without understanding the dialectic, the ternary dialectic between the sign, thing, and being. Okay, because the concept is in the mind of someone, of an interpreter. This is my ternarity. Now, let's apply this ternarity to knowledge or to intelligence. For example, let's begin by the, the thing. You have a lot of cognition that is related to the manipulation of things, the construction, the building of things, the management of things, and so on. This is one kind of intelligence. You have another kind of intelligence that is more formal, that is, uh, it is concerned mainly with the manipulation of science, okay? mathematics, uh, literature, and so on. People oppose literature and mathematics, but they are both formal kind of intelligence. So people are re related with science, related to things, and finally, people are in relation with other people. And this is the relational or emotional intelligence about uh, you know, psychology, ethics, uh, law, and so on. So in this sense, it, it's a way to think about interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. But the idea is that when you have some transformation in one of these three kinds of knowledge, you will have also a transformation in other kinds, in the two other kinds of knowledge. There is an interdependence between the three. They are not separated. Okay? Because this ternarity means an interdependence, not a separation. And now I come to a mix between the duality, virtual, actual, and the ternarity, sign, being, thing. And this is... Up. And here you have a first rep global representation 
of human collective intelligence. Let's begin by the actual. Okay. We have equipment like chairs, buildings, electronic things, everything that is material. Okay? We, we cannot do without this. Roads, the, the famous infrastructures. Okay? And then we have people, I mean real people with real relationships and social relationships between people. Okay? And we have a network uh, a flow of messages between the people, between the, the things inside the equipment. There is a flow of information. And of course, uh, all these things are connected. This is the actual part. Now, we are going to look at the virtual aspect. You have we have, of course, knowledge. We know that Brasilia is the federal capital of, of Brazil. Uh, when I know this, it's just in my mind. Okay? It has no materiality. Uh, all kinds of knowledge. There is not only knowledge, but there is also uh, everything that is related to norms, law, ethics, about the relation, uh, the abstract dimension of the relationship between people. You see, this is the sign. So you have the messages, and here you have the contents of the messages. Here you have the society, and here have the rules of the society. And here you have the materiality of the, so, of the, uh, the society, and there you have the virtuality of this materiality. Like, uh, for example, money, equipment, uh, uh, know-how, you know, skills, the ability to do, to do something real. And all these six aspects are always intertwined. And again, when there is a transformation somewhere, there will be consequences everywhere else. These are not separated aspects of the reality. They are all in interaction. And especially, there is an interaction virtual, actual, and sign being thing. Now I'm going more in detail to show you that you can go further and further. So it's a different representation, but it's exactly the same idea. You know, <laughs> Things, beings, signs, actual human development, virtual <coughs> human development. But there is something more to these three aspects that correspond to sign, being, thing. So sign will be more abstract. It's the first, uh, the first row: technology, competence, governance, social role, content, science. Being will be more affective, more emotional, and thing more concrete. So, for example, if we look at knowledge. Not knowledge in general anymore. We can distinguish sciences, arts, and wisdom. Different kinds of knowledge that, again, are not separated, but in interaction, interdependent. 
if we look at ethics, governance, this is more the executive aspect, values, and the precise rights and obligations. If we look at power, competencies, skills, morale, like more affective, and finally resources, mainly financial resources. If we think about messages, there is content, the actual process of communication, and a more concrete media. The people, you can decompose it, what are their social <coughs> roles, what is the quality of their relationship, and finally, how the social networks are really organized on the ground. And finally, equipment, you have the biophysical environment, you have the technology, and health, health being the uh, consideration of the fact that we have bodies. Now, if we look at health, <coughs> here we have a reflection of everything else on this table. It's not a particular, something that is isolated. Now, if I make a zoom on the health, especially public health, so again, we have knowledge, preferably evidence-based <coughs> knowledge, communication and information, laws and norms and uh, deontology and so on. The social networks, social networks of people working in the medical or health sectors, but also social network of people who have uh, illnesses or who have health problems and so on. Uh, and all, of course, these different social networks can interact. Okay? You know that currently there are a lot of people who have particular health problems. They are uh, speaking together in the online forums and so on. And finally, equipment and services. And all this is interdependent. You cannot separate. You need all, all these aspects. Okay? It's just a way to organize data, for example, or to organize a lot of uh, very uh, precise information. If you want to, to have a global view of what's happening, you can use this diagram. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going to speak about one of the main ways currently to use the new uh, communication system to develop, grow collective intelligence by fostering the autonomy of people. The autonomy of people working in the health sector, but also the autonomy of people having health problems. And this is called data curation. This notion of data curation is very, very broad. It is currently used in uh, education, in science, in all uh, 
social sectors where, where people try to develop collective intelligence using the new tools that are at our disposal. So, there are three aspects. There are three aspects. First, personal intelligence, then critical analysis of the sources, and finally, collective intelligence. Because you cannot have collective intelligence, efficient collective intelligence, if it is not based on personal <laughs> intelligence and critical analysis. Okay, it's not just, hey, collective intelligence, no. <laughs> you, it, it grows from personal intelligence, personal learning, and so on, of course, of course. So, and uh, the columns represent the three aspects of cognition, awareness, meaning, and memory. And by the way, this is sign being thing, sign being thing, and virtual actual. I didn't want to uh, make the diagram too much complex. Okay, let's begin by personal intelligence. I'm going through all this. It will take some time. So we can breathe. Personal intelligence. The first thing is attention management. Okay? Don't be distracted. Don't go on Facebook when I am speaking to you. Uh, <laughs> okay, more deeply, this means that in order to do okay. Before, before going into the detail, what is data curation? We, we have databases. Okay? I, I just spoke about megadata, big data, as you want. So, and uh, social systems today are made between the, in, in, in the interaction between data, algorithms, and real people collaborating. So, it is essential that people are able to build their own database. Social organizations, social networks, and so on. So the idea is that people control their own data. They build their own data. This is data curation. Okay? Just the so, control, maintain, categorize, use, uh, feed the database, and so on. This is data curation. So, taking responsibility of the data, of our data. So, personal intelligence, attention management. The first thing is to decide what are your priorities. What do you want to learn? What do you want to watch? On what subjects do you want to accumulate information? You have to choose. Okay, it's not any information about anything. No. You have priorities. It's important to, to set your priorities. The second thing is to, to choose your sources relevant sources. Relevant from the point of view of your priorities, of course. And from the point of view of trust. Can you believe these sources? Okay. Can be uh, experts, can be institutions, can be database made by some institution that you trust, and so on. Here it's very important 
the sources are not the platforms. Okay? Facebook is not a source. Twitter is not a source. Google is not a source. Okay? The source is the guy or the woman or the institution that is posting information on these platforms. Okay? We don't care about platforms. It can be any platform. What we care about is the source, the origin of the information, the, the people who decided that, okay, this is an important uh, data, an important information, okay? Then, you need a way to interpret the data. The data don't speak by themselves. So, you need some hypothesis, some leading principles to understand, to interpret the data, and you need to analyze the data according to these hypotheses. Okay, this is basic scientific methodology. Oh, but we are not scientists, why? should we use scientific methodology? Okay, if you want to uh, uh, grow a real collective intelligence, you need to do this. If you want to take responsibility of your data and the way you use it, you need to use this kind of methodology. It has not to be so precise, it has not necessarily to be formalized in a mathematical way and so on. But at least you need some hypothesis and some process of analysis. And then you should be able to manage the memory. First, you can record it on the cloud. Okay. I don't know, Google offers this for free, or you can use, I don't know, Dropbox, or, in, or uh, a group on Facebook, or anything. But you need the cloud, which means that the data should be accessible from anywhere. Okay. And finally, you need categorization, because if you don't categorize your data, you will not be able to retrieve it. And it should be, of course, it's better if the categories are related to your priorities and to your hypothesis, and if these categories help you to analyze the data. Okay? All this is interconnected. You should be able to do this by yourself. That's what I am teaching to my students. And this is, if, if nobody has priority, if nobody is able to categorize the data and so on, you will never have collective intelligence. Then there is the critical analysis. Uh, I underline here that it's not so much the data that you analyze critically than the source itself. You have to understand what is behind the source. What's the narrative behind, okay? Okay, first, you should not use one single source. You should diversify your sources, especially sources that have different point of views or in the scientific realm or the medical realm, sources that have different assumptions, different uh, uh, scientific theories. Okay? Not limiting yourself to one single point of view. And then, when you have diverse sources, you need to cross-check. This one says A, this other source say B, okay? and there can be C, D, and so on. 
This is external critique. I critique the different sources by themselves. Sources criticizing sources. Then there is the internal critique. You look at the source, I mean all the data produced by the same source. And you realize that they have a categorization system. The source is organizing the data by his or her own point of view, the way she, she organized the world, the world. And there is generally a narrative. They want to prove something, or they want to say that this is true, this is false, this, is, this was the beginning, this is the end, and so on. A source, in a way, is a narrative. It's, a, it's an illustration, and all the data of the source are an illustration of its narrative. So this is the internal critique. You understand what is inside, what organizes the cognition of the source. And finally, you can compare what the source is saying and what it is doing. And this is the pragmatic. Pragmatic because of doing. So the first thing is the, the references, the transparency of the source about its own sources. Okay? This is, uh, in, in the academic world, is the quotations, the bibliography, the notes, and so on. What, what is that? And sometimes you can recognize that they have a source that they are not mentioning. Okay. Or things like this. Or they are mentioning a source that they are not using. This is an absence of transparency. And finally, the agenda. What they want to do. And what they are doing in fact. Okay. What is their financing, what are their real results, and so on. Okay, this is the critical analysis. And finally, you have the collective intelligence. Uh, stigma, who knows what the word stigmatic means? Raise your hand. Those, nobody knows? Ooh. Go on Wikipedia immediately. Uh, so the, the stigma G is the way uh, social insects are communi communicating. Okay. For example, when an, an ant has found some Say, this is the ant hill, and this is a good thing for the for the ants. So she's there. And then I go back to the ant hill, and I am <coughs> leaving behind me a track of pheromones okay. and the other ants are smelling these pheromones, they are following the track and they found a good thing to eat. And they go back to the ant hill leaving another track of pheromone so the smell is stronger and there are other ants who and so on. So the idea is that the ants do not communicate between themselves by sending messages from one ant to the other ant. They are communicating by leaving traces in the environment. Okay? 
So they communicate by the medium of the, transform, the collaborative transformation of the environment. This is the stigmatic communication. We mainly communicate in the internet this way. The common environment is the common memory. Okay. We add new data, we add new categories, we create new links, we like this or that. And every time that we are doing this, we transform the common memory. And we transform the relationship between the data. Uh, okay, for example, on Facebook, when you like something, you give a powerful message because more, the more an information is liked, the more it will appear on the timelines of the people. And when you like someone, probably you will see messages from this person more often the next time. So you transform the whole memory, not only for you, but also for the others. Or you are on Amazon, you buy a book, you transform the recommendation for books for all the other people who has bought books that are related to the book that you just bought. Okay. Or you have a blog, you create a link between your blog entry and the blog entry of another blog. This means that the other blog will pop up higher on the Google ranking. Everything you do something, you transform the common memory. So you, this, <laughs> this is a kind of collective intelligence. Okay? This is the stigmatic communication in the virtual reality. There is a global aspect, the one I just spoke about, but there is also a local aspect. If you have a, a group on Facebook or on LinkedIn, or if you communicate with other people through a hashtag on Twitter, for example. This is for a small community. And it is very important to be aware of the priorities of this small community, to follow what they have said, uh, not to commit errors, I mean, um, social errors in the way you communicate, like asking a question when this question has already been responded, okay? or saying something rude for some people who are member of the group, this kind of thing. So you have to be conscious of the global community and of the local community. And if you have the ability to create the global context or end the local context, of course, you have to take responsibility. Okay? You, have to, uh, you have to understand that, of course, you did not do all this by yourself, but you have a part of responsibility of what's happening online. Uh, it's not that we have an ethical behavior in the real life, the so-called real life, and online we can do everything we want because it does not matter. It's not true. It matters, okay? Because at the other end of the screen or of the smartphone, there is a real person. There are real persons. And also we have to... Um, to realize the power that we have in the power to shape the common memory. And, you know, these two things go together, power and responsibility. And this is freedom. And finally, we got what we all want,
collaborative learning. Uh, this dialectic between externalization and internalization, I will explain with the last slide. Collaborative learning. Okay. What is in black, the uh, foreground, is what is actual, what is materialized, embodied. It's the real situation. We have a common practice. We are working together in the same sector, okay? uh, and there is a tacit knowledge, this means a knowledge that is embodied in the reflexes, in the experience, uh, something that we know because we have done it several times. Okay? It is in our nerves, that's why it is a tacit knowledge because Sometimes you are, we are not, we are able to do it, but we are not able to explain why we do this like this. Okay? But we know that it works. Okay? That's, that's the way it works. Uh, the challenge of collaborative learning is to transform the tacit knowledge into an explicit knowledge. Because the problem of tacit knowledge is that it is not easily trans trans transferred okay, to other people. We know how to do, if we have to explain how to do it, uh, we have to, I don't know, write something or take a video or anything, but something that will, that we can be transmitted to other people. Okay? A way to reify this living knowledge, to reify it in order to put it in a common memory so other people who want to be introduced to this practice can easily understand and finally try to do it and learn. Uh, so, there is a transformation between tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge. Generally, this will, because this is online, of course, you have data, okay, text, images, video, anything you want, software, simulation, uh, games, everything you want. Data. This data has to be categorized and, ideally, evaluated. Is it good? Is it very good? Is it not so bad? Okay, we have to. And, of course, this explicitation, categorization, evaluation, and so on, is made by the members of the community. These are the peers. They are working together. They are communicating. They are in a relation of dialogue. And they are helping each other to uh, create the common memory. And to use the common memory, the explicit knowledge, to transform it into tacit knowledge and common practice. Because it's, it's good to formalize knowledge in order to be able to transmit it, but then you have to read it or view it and so on and transform it into a real practice, of course. It goes both ways. And 
transformation of tacit into explicit and explicit into tacit is a collaborative process between peers. Okay, so you see, it goes like this, up, and then, voila. So this is <laughs> the dialectic of collaborative learning. And that's why it was so important to speak about data curation. Okay, because today uh, you cannot envis seriously collaborative learning without collaborative data curation. This is, for me, this is the key point. And I think that uh, these skills should be taught at the secondary level. Okay? Because it, th that's the way the society is going to work. Or we are going to be curated by others. Okay? We, we have to take... Uh, uh, we have to empower ourselves, but we cannot do it if we if not if we don't got the skills to do it. So that's my view of collaborative learning, uh, and I think that I'm going to stop here and <laughs> listen to your questions. <laughs>